feel well and so perform well today and tomorrow. We produce a range of horse health and nutrition products that are recognized all over the world for their ability to maximize the condition of your horse, increase performance and the overall health. With Coleto, your foremost common horse issues are solved. So you're in an environment where there's a lot of distractions for a young horse or a horse that hasn't been out and we're taking to a new environment and you're just getting that the horse to listen and be a little more focused on you. Better Calm comes in two forms, so a powder and a paste. So we find the paste great, you'll get a better focus and uh, response from the horse. So your, your performance reflects the horse's health. So if the horse isn't, its health is not, you know, isn't perfect, it's not going to perform well. If you haven't got the right muscle tone, be it a young horse or an old horse, if you can't get the right top line on them, you're in trouble. I mean, you, you just will not get that horse there. I know this product works because a horse that uh, has been down and out and, and, and not going very well, as soon as I put them on anabolic, they start eating better. They look better in the eye first, which will tell you everything. They're running well and they're pulling up even better. Swell Down is a product that I've used for three years at least. We use it daily. We use it at big competitions. It gets used on every horse at the end of the event and we know that they're safe then on the trip home. You need to eliminate any possibility that there might be a problem for trot up and, and to protect your horse. Like if, if there is in a way we can uh, improve its health and its soundness, well then we're going to do that. So if we can use the swell down, we know we're helping the horse as much as we can and eliminating as much risk for their, their soundness next day. Coleto is driven to achieve real and measurable results for your horse through innovative and quality products. We are continuously researching new products and forming strategic alliances with animal health organisations around the world. Coleto products must provide a proven benefit to your horse that are unique, value for money and that will deliver genuine worthwhile results to you. Coleto is supported by equine nutritionists, specialist equine veterinarians and other technical advisors to ensure that information supporting our products reflects the latest in equine nutritional knowledge and practice. Quite simply, Coleto products are the most effective available, represent value for money and produce to the highest level of integrity. Coleto Animal Health is an Australian company which develops and sells products worldwide to help horses feel well and so perform well today and tomorrow. We produce a range of horse health and nutrition products that are recognized all over the world for their ability to maximize the condition of your horse, increase performance and the overall health. With Coleto, your foremost common horse issues are solved. So you're in an environment where there's a lot of distractions for a young horse or a horse that hasn't been out and we're taking to a new environment and you're just getting that the horse to listen and be a little more focused on you. Better Calm comes in two forms, so a powder and a paste. So we find the paste great, you'll get a better focus and uh, response from the horse. So your, your performance reflects the horse's health. So if the horse isn't, its health is not, you know, isn't perfect, it's not going to perform well. If you haven't got the right muscle tone, be it a young horse or an old horse, if you can't get the right top line on them, you're in trouble. I mean, you, you just will not get that horse there. I know this product works because a horse that uh, has been down and out and, and, and not going very well, as soon as I put them on anabolic, they start eating better. They look better in the eye first, which will tell you everything. They're running well and they're pulling up even better. Swell Down is a product that I've used for three years at least. We use it daily. We use it 
big competitions, it gets used on every horse at the end of the event and we know that they're safe then on the trip home. You need to eliminate any possibility that there might be a problem for trot up and, and to protect your horse. Like if there is in a way we can improve its health and its soundness, well then we're going to do that. So if we can use the swell down, we know we're helping the horse as much as we can and eliminating as much risk for their, their soundness next day. Kaleto is driven to achieve real and measurable results for your horse through innovative and quality products. We are continuously researching new products and forming strategic alliances with animal health organisations around the world. Kaleto products must provide a proven benefit to your horse that are unique, value for money and that will deliver genuine worthwhile results to you. Kaleto is supported by equine nutritionists, specialist equine veterinarians and other technical advisors to ensure that information supporting our products reflects the latest in equine nutritional knowledge and practice. Quite simply, Kaleto products are the most effective available, represent value for money and produce to the highest level of integrity. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Natalie and I'm the Technical Manager and Nutritionist for Kaleido Animal Health. For those of you who don't know Kaleido, we are an Australian company that manufactures a range of horse nutrition supplements and health products. We are super excited to be hosting a three-part exclusive webinar series on equine digestive health and disease with leading equine veterinarian associate professor, Dr. Ben Sykes. Now, just a little background on Ben. Ben is a veterinarian with over 22 years clinical experience and is boarded with both the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine and the European College of Equine Internal Medicine. Throughout Ben's career, he has worked with a wide range of horses, focusing on high performance horses in racetrack breeding and sport horse settings. In addition to his interest and experience in management of high performance equine athletes, Ben has a strong interest in clinical research. Ben's research has focused on gastrointestinal diseases of the horse with a specific focus on equine gastric ulcer syndrome. Ben maintains a strong interest in postgraduate education and has trained several residents and numerous interns in a clinical setting. He is also experienced in undergraduate curriculum development and delivery, both at didactic and clinical levels, and has spoken at numerous conferences around the world. So this is a great opportunity to listen to the guru of equine gastric ulcer syndrome. And during this session, we will explore what's new in equine gastric ulcer syndrome, also known as EGIS with a specific focus on equine glandular gastric disease. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Ben will talk for approximately 45 minutes, after which we will have a short 10 minute break, followed by 15 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you to those of you who pre-submitted their questions. You are also welcome to ask questions during Ben's talk but we will just wait till the end to answer those questions. So you'll just see at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side, there's a Q&A section. So feel free to ask your questions throughout and then we'll just wait till the end to answer them. So with that note, I will pass the reins to Ben. So please sit back, relax and enjoy. Thanks guys. Thanks, Nat, and thanks to everyone for uh, attending. I think we've got people from uh, Australia, New Zealand, as far as Finland, and maybe even the UK as well, and we might have snuck a few in from elsewhere. Uh, it's a subject that I've spent a lot of time looking at as a researcher, and a subject that I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at as a, re uh, as a clinician as well. So, and thank you to Collado for the opportunity to present. So, some of this will be stuff that we've talked about before, but hopefully, you know, there's going to be something new here for, for everyone, really. Uh, my affiliations, I am an associate professor at Massey University, and I have honorary positions at the University of Queensland and the University of Liverpool in the UK. Uh, 
And I've worked for a range of companies over the years, including consulting to Collado Animal Health as a declaration of interest. So what we're going to do today is we're going to review some of the current thinking on equine gastric ulcer syndrome. We're going to clarify the terminology that surrounds equine gastric ulcer syndrome. And we're going to look at the key factors that relate to the prevalence, so how, often, how common the disease is, the risk factors for the disease, and the pathophysiology or the causative factors for the disease as well. And we're going to look at that across both squamous and glandular disease, which we'll come across in a second. The focus of what we're talking about today is adult horses. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about is translatable to foals, but really what we're talking here is adult horses and foals are a, a little beast of their own in many ways, including the way their stomach behaves. So the terminology, clarifying and understanding the terminology is really important to our understanding of the disease. The term equine gastric ulcer syndrome has been around since 1999. It uh, came out with what was originally sort of a consensus statement between experts in the field, just as we were starting to understand and learn about diseases of the horse's stomach. The thing is that the terminology has changed and the terminology now of equine gastric ulcer syndrome is very often either inappropriately or incompletely used. And what this is, is this is a legacy of the short gastroscopes that were used in the original studies. So the original studies that looked at the horse's stomach used gastroscopes that were typically two and a half meters. And when you have a two and a half meter gastroscope, all you can see is the squamous mucosa of the horse, this uh, bright whitish, yellowish material here, which is the squamous mucosa of the horse, which we'll talk about disease of in a second. When we started using longer scopes, sort of in the early 2000s and through where it would now be standard that we use a three meter, or a three, meter, three and a half meter scope, we started to recognize that there was a lot more going on much deeper in the stomach. So as we look down into the pylorus, which is where the stomach empties into the small intestine, we started to recognize there was a whole different set of diseases, but it took a long time for this to flow through into the terminology and into the conversations that we're having. And that's something we're gonna look really focus on talking about today because there are really distinct differences between diseases in the squamous mucosa and diseases in the glandular mucosa. And really there is no such thing as a diagnosis of EGUS. EGUS is a, an overarching umbrella term, but if we're actually gonna talk about the diagnosis, we really need to talk about equine squamous gastric disease versus equine glandular gastric disease. And the reasons for that will become evident as we go through the talk and we reflect on the, the absolute disparity between the two diseases in terms of the causative factors, who gets affected, and next the week when we start talking about treatment, how we treat them and how they respond to treatment and prevention. So if we look at the literature and we look at something, anything really pre-2015, and in 2015 we came out with a second consensus statement to clarify this terminology, if we look at anything pre-2015, really, it's hard to tell whether they're talking about the squamous mucosa or the glandular mucosa because they simply just call it EGUS as an overarching disease. But generally what we can assume is if it's not specifically stated that they're looking at the glandular mucosa, that all of those studies are talking about the squamous mucosa. If you get onto good old Dr. Google and you Google about risk factors for squamous ulcers or risk factors for ulcers or risk factors for EGUS, does my horse have ulcers? nearly everything you read will be based on what we know about the squamous mucosa and disease of the squamous mucosa. And that is not gonna be applicable to diseases of the glandular mucosa. So as we've said, EGUS is an umbrella term. It's not overarching and it simply describes diseases of the stomach. But if we wanna get into the nitty gritty, we need to start thinking about being more specific and defining equine squamous gastric disease. And this is disease of the approximately half to a third of the top half of the stomach. Um, the squamous mucosa is like our esophagus and in the horse extends down into the top half of the stomach. The stomach is a single chamber, but has two very distinct linings in the top half and the bottom half. We know a lot about equine squamous gastric disease and most of what you will have read previously, heard previously and know from gastric ulcers is really about squamous disease. Glandular gastric disease affects the bottom half of the stomach or the bottom third of the stomach, two thirds of the stomach. 
And really what we're talking about here is primarily at the outflow of the stomach, which is what we call the pylorus. And so it's just where the, we see that hole, that small hole in the bottom right hand side of the screen there as we go into the small intestine. It's surrounding this area that we see disease in the glandular mucosa. We've only really started to understand this in a relatively short period of time, less than five years. And so this disease is far less well understood um, and less well described, which is why it doesn't show up when we talk about the, the layman's terminology of equine gastric ulcers. But it's really essential that we differentiate between squamous disease and glandular disease because they are in different parts of the stomach. The prevalence or the rate of occurrence is different and the horses that get affected by diseases, by the two diseases are different. What causes them different is different in terms of risk factors. Also the process of disease is different and the response to treatment is different as well. And so if we, if we fall back and use the umbrella term equine gastric ulcer syndrome, but really our horse has glandular disease and we try to address risk factors and we try to treat and we try to do lots of things that are based on what we know about squamous disease, we're going to have minimal of any impact on glandular disease risk or occurrence. And that's a really important thing for us to understand. In many ways, I think of these guys, squamous and glandular disease as the odd couple. They just happen to live in the same apartment. They both happen to live in the same anatomical structure, which is the stomach, but they are not related. There's no relationship between one and the other, and we can't extrapolate what we know about one, primarily squamous disease, to what we know about glandular disease. So what do we know about squamous disease? Well, squamous disease, it includes primary and secondary disease. Primary disease is a management associated disease, and we'll talk about that in a fair bit of detail. We occasionally secondary, see secondary disease where we'll have a delay in the gastric outflow, so something's impeding the stomach's ability to empty and we get a backlog of acid. Fortunately, that's relatively rare, and really what we see is primarily a management associated disease, which we'll talk through in a second. As we look across the screen, we sort of grade our squamous disease from zero, which is a normal healthy mucosa, squamous mucosa on the left, to grade one in the, the second from the left. And then grade two, we start seeing these small focal lesions. And then the two we see on the right hand side, there are very deep, severe, nasty, grade four out of four uh, squamous lesions. We do have different grading systems. Some people use four, some people use five. It's somewhat arbitrary what you use because there's clearly a difference between a very severe lesion over here on the right and a normal or mild lesion here on the left. So why does squamous disease occur? Well, squamous disease is a very simple process. The top half of the stomach is lined with squamous mucosa. The squamous mucosa is the same as our esophagus and the same as our skin. If we take this squamous mucosa and we add acid to it, it doesn't like acid and we get ulcers. So it's a very direct causative effect between the exposure of a tissue that doesn't like acid and has limited defense mechanisms against acid to very, very corrosive acid that is produced in the stomach. So there are different acids that do this. Hydrochloric acid, which is the one produced by the stomach is, is the dominant one. Um, we can get a pH in the, in the bottom half of the stomach as low as one uh, under normal conditions. So it can be an extremely acidic environment and horses are extremely effective at producing acid. But we can also have a role of the volatile fatty acids. So the volatile fatty acids form when we have soluble carbohydrate in the stomach and we have the resident bacteria ferment that. And that potentially adds to the erosive process or corrosive process that the acid has in our squamous mucosa. But we do know that hydrochloric acid is the dominant acid because if we treat these horses with squamous disease with a drug that removes acid production such as omeprazole, the ulcers heal regardless of what we do to the carbohydrate in the diet. So it's really the volatile fatty acids add to the process, but it's the hydrochloric acid that is driving the process. So what happens in a normal stomach is really important to understanding how this disease occurs and how we can manage and prevent this disease, which we'll talk about in more detail next week. If we look on the left here, what we have is a normal horse's stomach. And what we can see is a very, very acidic fluid ventrally. And then we go up with a pH gradient and around about the level where the squamous and glandular mucosa join, which we term the margopicatus, we have a pH of about four to five. And this is sort of a magic number for disease and for the, the acid to become corrosive. If we were to look inside a horse's stomach like we do on the right, that's been eating hay, particularly 
good roughage style hay, what we'll see is there's a ball of food in that stomach. And that ball of food is really, really important because it serves as a physical barrier preventing the acid that's in the ventral part of the stomach from splashing up during exercise. And it's that ball of food that becomes very, very central to how we manage squamous disease risk across all populations. So feeding is important. We also know that exercise is very important. So if we look at the pH on the left here, if we look at the pH of the horse's stomach around that level of the margopicatus, it sits at sort of seven, reasonably high, just with just inside the stomach there. And when we exercise horses, the pH up in that area drops very, very quickly. And effectively what we have is the horse squeezes its abdominal muscles. Anything above a trot will achieve this, or sorry, anything at a trot or above will achieve this. The horse squeezes its abdominal muscles and that physically reduces the volume or the space of the, the bottom half of the stomach and just pushes the acid up dorsally into the top half of the stomach where it's not meant to be and where the squamous mucosa doesn't have adequate defense mechanisms. And so very commonly when we see the lesions, we see the lesions around that margin, right on the junction of the glandular and squamous mucosa at the margopicatus. And as I said, anything at a trot or above is enough to do this. There's actually little difference between uh, a trot and a gallop in terms of the acid exposure to the squamous mucosa. What's very important though is the duration of exposure. So the length at which we exercise horses is gonna have a significant impact upon the time that the acid is spent physically pushed up where it doesn't belong and causing damage uh, of the squamous mucosa there. So if we look at just here as this graphic, what we see here is we have this very sort of high density liquid and effectively we get this, as we compress the stomach, particularly from the bottom, we get this splashing and we can see that red acid start splashing up and splashing onto the squamous mucosa, which is not designed to, to interact with acid in any way, shape or form. So diet is a risk factor. Um, hay, we've talked about roughage, we've talked about high, high carbohydrates are a risk factor. We know that those volatile fatty acids will worsen the hydrochloric injury, particularly when the pH is less than four. And when we talk next week about management and prevention, we keep coming back to this idea of the pH of four and how we can stratify the pH. But it's important to recognize that grain and commercial processed feeds are not the devil. It's been sort of hung out for a long time that I can't feed my horse any grain because it'll get gastric ulcers. And that's really not true. In fact, it's not true in many ways. And it's important that we recognize when we consider the role of carbohydrates that we can counteract this by providing appropriate roughage. So if we can create that ball in the stomach and we can make sure that that stratification is in place and we can make it very hard for that acid to splash around, we can have a big impact on both the hydrochloric acid and the volatile fatty acids from spilling up and causing excess damage. It's critical that we recognize that most of the damage is done by the hydrochloric acid and that the, the volatile fatty acids are just an additive factor as well. The other thing that's really important to recognize is, is when we look at the role of diet in experimental studies, the quantity is really, really important. The amount of carbohydrate used in the studies that were shown to, were demonstrated the risk factor associated with squamous disease and used to understand the disease process were very, very high carbohydrate diets. Far, far, far in excess of what we would ever feed a riding horse or a sport horse. Much more comparable to the sorts of diets that race horse, racehorses eats, a racehorse eats, and that potentially, and that's one of the key contributors and key factors which explains why we see so much squamous disease in the racehorse population. But as I said, in the sport horse population and riding horse population, the amount of carbohydrate we feed these horses as a base level feed is not enough to really change the disease risk of squamous disease. Pasture turnout intuitively would be protective. So if we think about roughage, we think that grass should be protective. Um, we don't actually have a lot of evidence to support this. We have some data that says it does, and we have other data that support, says that pasture turnout's not protective. And interestingly, the study that said it is not protective came out of New Zealand. And if you go and look at New Zealand pasture, they're very lush, they're very green, and they don't have a lot of physical structure to them. They don't have a lot of roughage and stem to the grass. And I think it's important that roughage and that stem is important when we think about creating that ball of food. It's not just the quantity that goes in, it's the type of food that we put in as well to ensure that we have the physical structure to stop that acid from splashing around. 
And again, we'll talk more about that next week when we talk about different sorts of hay and ro what role they might play. My experience has been that if you put all of those factors together and we look at the amount of exercise that uh, sport horses do and, and riding horses do, and we look at the diets that an average sport horse or riding horse would eat, that it's actually relatively uncommon to see squamous gastric disease in that population because we've got very good over the last 15 to 20 years of understanding the risk factors and reducing the risk of disease associated with diet particularly. We do see it a lot in racehorses and that's because the impact of the diet is much more and the impact of the training is much more as well. So it's a double whammy for the racehorse population. So really for me, there's a lot of other factors you can talk about for squamous disease, but really for me, it's quite simple. If you look across this graph, the harder you work, the more intense you exercise and the more intense you management, particularly your management associated with high grain diets, the more likely you are to have disease and it's a relatively linear relationship. If you get onto Dr. Google or you look into the literature, there are a range of other things, age, sex, a whole bunch of different things that are described as potentially associated with squamous gastric disease, which are true, that they are real effects, but they're dwarfed in comparison to the impact of diet and the impact of exercise on disease risk. So it may be different between males and females, but that's nothing compared to the impact of diet or exercise. And we see that when we look at our populations, we just have a, some data here from a few studies. And what we have here on the left is horses re living relatively set up, uh, relaxed lifestyles, endurance horses, resting sports, ponies, warm bloods, not exercising terribly intensely, not eating these high carbohydrate diets. On the right, we have our thoroughbreds and endurance horses and our racing endurance horses. And we always think that thoroughbreds are the poster children for squamous disease, but really the endurance horses are the ones that do enormous amounts of work and, need, and consume enormously high carbohydrate diets to do that. And what we see here is this blue line, which if we go from left to right is in terms of increasing intensity of exercise, the blue is the risk of squamous disease. And we see it pretty much goes up as those horses live more and more intense lifestyles consistent with what we've just been talking about. So most of that's probably not really news to anyone and everyone's probably quite comfortable with the idea of squamous disease. And um, at this point starting to think, well, what are we gonna learn new today? Well, hopefully this is where we move on to things that start getting a little bit different, a little bit new. And when we start talking about equine glandular gastric disease, and this includes disease that's hyperemic, so it's sort of an inflammatory response, erosive or ulcers within the glandular mucosa, primarily at the emptying of the stomach here in the pyloric antrum. It's actually relatively rare to see true ulcers and perforation of ulcers is extraordinarily rare in adult horses. And so we don't call it uh, glandular ulcer disease, we call it um, more, more sort of general gastric disease because what we're seeing really here mostly is inflammatory and erosive lesions that are causing uh, our clinical signs. And as I said, true ulcers and ulcer perforation are extraordinarily rare events in the adult horse. They do occasionally occur in foals, but likely for other reasons than what we're talking about here. So if we, look at, if we look at glandular disease, if we go left to right, we have a nice, normal, pink, shiny, healthy glandular mucosa with a sort of sheen to it. The next one across, we have hyperemia. Our mucosal barrier will still be intact, but we have this sort of red, angry look to the stomach. And then we start seeing these small focal lesions. As we come across to the right, we start seeing the kind of classic lesions that we'll see, particularly the second one from the right, classic lesions that we'll see very, very commonly in the riding and sport horse population, particularly the warm blood population, these large linear lesions, particularly in the bottom uh, part of the pyloric antrum there. That ridge there is probably about the size of my finger. Um, so it's a very significant change in the structure of the stomach, as well as having this exposed uh, eroded area. And on the right, we have a very, very severe version, um, which you can see is very swollen compared to the left there. And it's actively bleeding, actively inflamed. And you can imagine, that the, the association with disease with that would be very significant. Why does this occur? Uh, it's a breakdown of normal defense mechanisms. Normally we've got a very uh, effective mucobicarbonate layer. So we have sort of an alkaline slime that coats the glandular mucosa because this area is used to living in acid. So we have sophisticated and effective defense mechanism. And for some reason that breaks down. We don't really understand why, um, but we understand it to be the way um, without actually knowing what causes it. We've identified some risk factors, but the actual specific process we haven't been able to put our fingers on yet. 
So what could it be? Well, based on human medicine, we know that in human medicine, Helicobacter is the number one cause of, of uh, gastric ulcers or peptic ulcer disease in the Western world. And that's been looked for in the horse and there's no evidence that it's caused by Helicobacter. And we have no evidence to really strongly support the role of any other bacteria as well. So it doesn't appear to be Helicobacter pylori associated, um, unlike a lot of human peptic ulcer disease. The other big one in human medicine is the use of non-steroidals. So in humans, it's ibuprofen and similar drugs to that. In horses, it's phenidine or flunixin and bute or phenylbutazone that we potentially, that have the potential to cause these disease, potential to cause glandular disease. And they can cause it, especially if we use it at higher than labeled doses. And we don't have to go a lot higher than the labeled dose to get toxicity. Although it's relatively uncommon to see genuine toxicity associated with the use of phenylbutazone or flunixin, phenidine for a short duration, for, for a short duration under sort of normal clinical conditions. So uh, I don't personally overly stress about the risk of non-steroidals in, in treating horses, but we're just conscious that we make sure that we stay within the dosing guidelines and we stay within uh, the label recommendations for the dose. Because once we go above that, we certainly do see disease. But what we do know is, is that even if we can cause disease with non-steroidals, it doesn't explain the very high prevalence of the population. So the majority of horses that we see with glandular gastric disease have never had non-steroidals in recent times and or never in their life, um, certainly not within recent times. So it, it's, we can't blame that for the non-steroidals. And interestingly, in humans, these non-non-steroidal, non-helicobacter peptic ulcer disease is becoming an increasing problem as well. And they, it makes us feel a little bit better because they don't know what causes them either. They've just identified some of the risk factors and the way that you treat them similar to the approach that we take in the horse. So much, much less well described. Um, what we do know is that extrapolation for squamous to glandular disease is inappropriate. And to do so gives a false sense of security. So a well-meaning owner may spend a, a lot of time and effort on ensuring that their management is absolutely perfect and have themselves sort of convinced that they've reduced the risk of gastric ulcers when in fact they've probably done an exceptionally good job of reducing the risk of squamous disease, but we can still see glandular disease regardless of all, all the perfect management that we apply for squamous disease. So if we wanna stop glandular disease, we need to identify the different risk factors and we need to target them separately, um, sometimes more so depending on the population that we're talking about. There's no effect of age, sex, seasonality, and there's no role to support there's no data or minimal data to support the role of diet in glandular gastric disease. And that's really, really cornerstone. So we know that squamous disease is a disease of the diet, particularly when we get to the extremes of high carbohydrate intake. Glandular disease is not a disease of the diet and dietary modification in terms of managing the amount of carbohydrate in the diet is not going to change our risk of glandular disease one little bit. There are other things we can do for the diet that might play a benefit and role preventatively but it's not about carbohydrate like squamous disease is. And that's really, really important that we, we, we focus on that. What the other thing that's really important is, is you know, squamous disease, we primarily and traditionally would say that it's primarily a disease of race and endurance horses. These horses that live very intense management lifestyles, have very high carbohydrate diets and exercise for high, high intensity for extended durations of time. Glandular disease is a much more common in the riding horse and sport horse population. So we see it in a population that we would generally, five years ago, we would have said they're not at risk of gastric ulcers and we wouldn't have even considered gastric ulcers as likely in that population. Now, as we learn more and more about glandular disease, we recognize more and more that it's the exact opposite population we see that has the highest risk for glandular gastric disease. Um, so what role does intensive management and those sorts of things play in it? This is a study we did in the UK of the group there. And, Really what we have on the right hand side here is we have looking at our glandular disease and the red is some feral ponies that went through an abattoir and the blue is domesticated horses that were sent to slaughter. And what we can see is, is that ulcers were relatively uncommon in the feral population, um, both squamous and glandular, but both squamous and glandular were more common in the domesticated horse population. So domestication and management of these horses plays a role in the development of both squamous disease, which we've known for a long time, but this also provides some evidence that this broad concept of domestication provides a, a stimulus for the development of glandular disease as well. It's not overly useful to us as clinicians, but it certainly 
suggest that there's a management related disease to a certain certain level. The question is, is you know, what level of management and what specific management is there? If we look here, we see similar sort of thing. This is actually one of the few studies where we've looked at horses over a period of time and we have endurance horses resting here. And we take across to the right, we take the same population of endurance horses and look at them when they're racing. And we see that the squamous disease risk goes up quite dramatically, which we would expect based on what we've talked about. But we also see that the glandular disease risk doubles as well. But what we also see here is that our thoroughbreds, but in here our sports ponies and warm bloods um, also have quite high rates of glandular disease. These rates of squamous disease that are reported for these sports ponies and warm bloods are a little bit old data and we probably wouldn't see that as much now. This is back 15 year old data where the dietary management of these horses would no, was nowhere near as good as it is now. And so these squamous rates are probably overstated in the, in the modern population. But the glandular rates are certainly something that we recognize. So it's one thing to say that management causes or contributes to glandular disease. The question is, can we be more specific than that? We've said it's not a disease of diet. Is it a disease of exercise? In squamous disease, we said it's a, a disease of how long you exercise for and that exposure of acid. In glandular disease, exercise plays a role, but it appears to be in a different mechanism. And we have two studies that support that, which is what we have here. So in this one particular study, which was show jumpers in Canada, what they were looking at was glandular disease. And what they saw is that horses that were exercising six or seven days a week were three and a half times more likely to have glandular disease than horses that exercise five days or less. And this was a multivariate analysis, so it should correct for things like trainer and a range of other factors. This is a study we did in Australian racehorses up uh, where I live in Coffs Harbour and what we showed and the UK as well we had a collaborative research with a group over there and what we showed is in this population is horses that exercise five six or seven days a week were ten times more likely to get glandular disease or have glandular disease than horses that only exercise four days a week or less. So exercise plays a role in squamous but it also plays a role in glandular but it, it in the study, it was independent of the intensity and duration of exercise. It was associated with the number of days per week. Looked at another way, what it looks like is it's really important that horses have rest days um, for, for gastric health at least. It looks really important that we give horses dedicated rest days and ideally at least three dedicated rest days a week for their gastric health to allow that gastric mucosa to recover and repair from whatever injury is associated with exercise. And that's one of those really cornerstone things that we look at when we think about how we manage disease risk in a population, how we manage disease risk in an individual that has a history of glandular gastric disease. So what about stress? Well, stress has been bandied around for a long time um, as a cause of squamous disease, but there's really very minimal evidence to support the role of stress per se. And, and stress is somewhat of a, a nebulous term at the best of times. But what we are seeing is that there's a growing body of evidence that behavioral stress is central to the disease process so to, of glandular disease. So what we're seeing is, is that um, a, a range of data that says is that is if we stress horses or we have horses that are stressy, they're more likely to get glandular disease than, than horses that aren't. And so the really big question here is, you know, what is stress for a horse? And that's going to be very different from horse to horse. They certainly don't study for exams. Uh, they, they don't generally worry about their appearance. Uh, the dressage horses might um, be very concerned that they look the part, um, but most horses probably aren't too fussed about what they look like. So what, you know, what is stress for a horse is, is something that we really have to work very hard to define. This is a study just briefly supporting this. It's basically it's a study out of Switzerland. And what they showed here was they gave a, a group of horses, two groups of horses, horses that had glandular gastric disease, which are in the shaded boxes, and horses that didn't have glandular gastric disease, which are in the white boxes. They gave them ACTH, which is, stimulates cortisol release and is a marker of how active the stress response is in the horse. And what you can see quite clearly there is that the horses in the gray boxes had a much more uh, pronounced stress response than the horses in the white with the white boxes. So horses with glandular gastric disease had a more pronounced stress response than horses without glandular gastric disease. What we don't know is whether that's cause or effect. Does the increased stress responsiveness or predisposition to stress responsiveness cause the disease or does the disease make them more likely to have this exaggerated response? And what we need to do is follow some horses over time to see if this changes as we treat the disease and resolve the lesions, does their stress response come back as well? 
or do they continue to have this exaggerated stress response? This is another study uh, looking at stress. Uh, this is a population in Finland. Um, shout out to the Finns there, my old stomping ground for a few years as well. Um, and this was a study that looked at a, a population of horses, particularly Finnish warm bloods, standard breds, and uh, sorry, Finnish cold bloods, standard breds, and then warm bloods, and their riding horse population, uh, which would be a mixture of those uh, warm blood type breeds. And they looked at what, you know, what are the risk factors for glandular gastric disease. And basically, the number one risk factor for being a glandular, having glandular gastric disease in this population was being a warm blood. If you're a warm blood, you are much like, more likely to have glandular gastric disease than if you're a standard bred or if you were a, a cold-blooded breed or something like that. What we don't have in here is the thoroughbred population. There's not enough horses in Finland to give us an idea of where the thoroughbred sits on the scheme uh, in terms of sensitivity to disease. Is this a genetic factor? Is it that warm bloods are genetically predisposed to glandular disease or is it an implication of behavior? Is it because horses are very, warm blood horses are very soft and sensitive and reactive to their environment? Is, is it that that then makes them more likely to be stressy, which then in turn causes a greater risk of glandular gastric disease? The other thing that was interesting in this study was they showed that both increased number of handlers and then in the final analysis, increased number of riders, uh, sticklers will say it's not a technically a statistically significant p-value, but it's still there. Increased number of handlers and increased number of riders increase the risk of glandular gastric disease. And we don't really know why that is, except to go back to this concept of behavioral stress. And we know that these horses like routine, particularly the Northern Hemisphere horses that live in very structured environments. We know that they like routine. We know that there's a very strong human animal bond and that they bond to individuals differently or engage with individuals differently. And so it appears that changing those individuals can be a behavioral stressor. Uh, for horses and can put them at increased risk of glandular gastric disease. Not every horse, um, but across a population level, it certainly seems to be important. Increased number of riders, I think, if we think about the way these, particularly the, the way that we ride riding horses and sports horses, um, you know, we're expecting them to interpret relatively subtle signals and do something right. And, and the reward is for that is release of pressure. The, the downside of that is if you don't get the signal right, is the pressure's held on. And that pressure's put there for a purpose to teach the horse to move away from the pressure, but it also potentially becomes a source of behavioral stress. And if we change the rider, we might have someone pressing pretty much the same button, but not exactly the same button, the horse gets confused. We can relatively easily see how that could be a source of uh, psychological or emotional or behavioral stress for a horse. So I, I think there's enough here to really build into the idea that when we manage glandular disease, we've got to manage the environment of the horse, not just uh, other sort of bigger, broader factors. We've got to manage sort of the emotional well-being of the horse for want of a better term. So take home messages. We cannot extrapolate one to the other. We just simply can't. They're entirely different diseases. They just happen to share the same, muco uh, same compartment of the horse's stomach. Squamous disease, primarily a disease of domestication and, and intensive and highly intensive management. Glandular disease, we see relatively high prevalences or quite high prevalences in groups that we would say traditionally were at low risk of ulcers. And this is especially true in our sport and riding horse population, and especially true in warm bloods. As I said, we don't know from that study where thoroughbreds fit in, but my, my feeling is, is that thoroughbreds fit somewhere in between. Um, we have some thoroughbreds that are extremely sensitive and behave in many ways like warm bloods. And then we have just the laid back cool thoroughbred that is, behaves more like an Australian stock horse or a quarter horse or something like that. And so they probably full, fulfill the full spectrum, but they've got the capacity to operate at both ends. It's certainly not a disease of diet, and that's something that's really important um, when we try to stop it. So what about the clinical signs? Wide range of clinical signs described. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for a lot of the clinical signs. A lot of them are anecdotal. But what we need to recognize is when we look at something at a population level, just because we don't see something at a population level doesn't mean it doesn't affect one individual horse or that individual horse. And one of the things that we sort of increasingly uh, recognize in the veterinary world, we know, for example, the most sensitive marker of a horse having respiratory disease is owner reported signs of respiratory disease. Far more sensitive than any test that we can apply to a horse. If the owner says my horse is slow to recover from exercise, I think it has an airway problem, then that's a far more accurate test than us auscultating the lungs or something like that. And my belief is it's very similar when we talk about gastric health. The owner's ability to perceive subtle differences in their horse's behavior, um, I think is, is really, really high 
uh, for people who spend a lot of time around their animals, which are, I'm assuming would be many people in this audience. And when we were treating these horses, we used to play the game, is it better yet? And so what we would do is we'd have a horse that's been treated for gastric ulcers and we would ask the owner, is it better yet? And they would say, yes, no, or maybe a little bit. And then we'd scope the horse and we'd look to see whether it was better or not. And I would say to the owners, I never got around to collating the data and publishing it, but the owner's ability to predict healing was remarkable. The owner's ability to say, my horse is better. He's back to where he normally is or what he used to be was really quite remarkable um, for something that was often described as a very nebulous or vague clinical sign that we really couldn't see in front of us because we're standing in front of a horse at rest in a strange environment. And the last thing it's worrying about is these subtle things that happen during exercise. So the individual effect is definitely important. Do we see colic? We do have some degree association of colic uh, with squamous disease. And my clinical impression is that it's really important for glandular disease, particularly in the warm blood population. So horses that are having multiple episodes of colic, having a look in their stomach and scoping their stomach would be one of the first things that I would do every single day of the week to make sure that they don't have glandular gastric lesions that need to be dealt with to reduce the risk of them having something potentially more significant and serious uh, associated with their next colic. So less so in, uh, in broader population of horses, but I think there really is a strong link in, in warm bloods, although we haven't been able to prove that in the scientific literature yet. Weight loss, inappetence, poor body condition, failure to maintain weight, failure to thrive. Uh, there's pretty good evidence of association. That's by far the most consistent clinical sign that we see across the board. Behavioural uh, nervousness, there's conflicting reports actually, and aggressiveness is an interesting one. In some reports, aggressive horses are more likely to have disease, and in other reports, aggressive horses are less likely to have disease. I think it probably depends a lot on the horse. There's definitely an association with crib biting. Uh, we know that there's a strong association with crib biting and squamous disease, not so clear with glandular disease. And the reason why we see crib biting with squamous disease is that act of cribbing and tensing the abdominal musculature mimics the effect of exercise in terms of squeezing the stomach and physically pushing that acid up. But as I said, the behavioral effect of, of what the owners report, I think I find to be sort of the most common clinical sign uh, on top of weight loss or inappetence. And it's changes in behavior are particularly important. So some horses are just jerks and they're always gonna be jerks. Other horses are, most horses probably start out life as pretty nice. And then if they suddenly turn into a jerk, you're looking for reasons why that may be. Um, and pain is certainly gonna be one of those, whether it be gastric pain or orthopedic pain. Poor hair coat, diarrhea, not so much. We're starting to understand more and more the role about hindgut and this dysbiosis and this chronic diarrhea and this increased fecal water and all those sorts of things. And we're gonna talk about that in the third of the series of webinars uh, in a couple of weeks time. So a little bit of research here again, just to show what we see. Um, basically, the, the dot here, this is the, if you're on this line, you have no increased risk of disease. If you go to the right of disease, you, right of the line, you have an increased risk. And to the left of the line, you have a decreased risk. So wherever this dot fits, uh, gives you an idea of the increased risk of disease. And then this bar is the spread of the likelihood of that risk. So ideally, we, if, if we want to be confident that something's causing a disease, we should see a dot well out here and a narrow bar. And what you can see here is nearly all of these bars cross one which highlights how hard it is to show these effects at a population level. This is some research that um, a colleague of mine worked with uh, from Finland again, and he's continued this work. He's now in London. He's continuing this work to build more and more numbers to build around this. But what do we see? So for squamous disease, we see a low body condition score. We see unexplained weight loss, and we see poor appetite as the dominant clinical signs. For me, I think of squamous disease as heartburn for horses. And it, it basically, I think it makes them feel crappy. It gives them a discomfort that makes them reduce their, particularly their roughage intake. Um, they may well eat their hard feed still, but not their roughage or other horses will do the other way around. But they decrease their total caloric intake and that has an impact on their body condition and body score. So as I said, heartburn for horses. Uh, cribbing shows up here, which we talked about. And then interestingly, lethargy or laziness, um, surprise, surprise, being lazy appears to be protective for uh, squamous disease. So if you don't do much and don't run around too much and don't exercise too much, you're not gonna probably get too much squamous disease, which fits with everything that we know of the disease. Glandular disease, much, much harder to pull out at a population level what's going on. We see a wide range of possible things, but again, it seems to be that weight loss is our most common. I think the problem here is, is that in this particular study, we weren't asking the right questions. And this goes back sort of five or eight years, this study. And I think as we're learning more, 
we're asking better questions and we're starting to pull out better risk factors like the role of exercise that we pulled out in those two studies. So what about poor performance? I mean, one of the common things is, you know, every horse has got gastric ulcers, why should I worry about it? Um, yeah, some degree, I mean, I'd say we all die as well, um, but we spend an awful lot of time trying to avoid that. Um, and just because something's common doesn't mean that it's not bad. Um, I think we have welfare obligations to make sure that our horses are um, looked after and free of pain particularly, I think is a, is a critical welfare thing that we need uh, as a moral obligation as horse owners. Poor performance. Um, we definitely see indirect effects. We know that you know, horses that have issues with gastric disease, if they're not eating, then they struggle to recover. And really for me, when we're away at a competition and when I'm talking about a horse not eating, it'll probably be okay if it doesn't eat overnight, it'll probably come out and perform the next day um, acceptably. But really what worries me is horses don't eat, they don't drink. And when you're away at a competition and your horse stops eating, then you start worrying about the fact that your horse is not drinking. And horses that don't drink get very sick. Horses that don't drink get travel sickness and a range of different things, they have muscle problems. And so this recovery effect of consuming, particularly roughage, which is the main driver of thirst, is really, really important for me when I think about performance and gastric disease. There's also some indirect effects. Uh, we know that in humans, gastric pain causes a decreased time to exhaustion. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is heartburn in, in human athletes, similar to squamous disease, we know that the athletes with, and it's really common for them to get it for exactly the same reasons. We know that human athletes with GERD have a decreased time to exhaustion. It actually affects their performance, not just their comfort level. Some of these guys are, you know, ultra marathon runners and stuff like that. They're seriously physically tough, but physiologically they cannot perform to the same level. And we have a little bit more evidence to support that, which is we've got a couple of studies that show that horses with squamous disease are gonna perform below expectation. And there was one quite cool study with a small number of horses where they looked at them with squamous disease and they measured proxies for cardiovascular performance, primarily oxygen consumption, and they measured stride length. And then they treated the squamous disease and they looked at the horses again. And the horses had a greater stride length and increased oxygen consumption, which is a good marker for uh, aerobic performance um, with the treatment of squamous gastric disease. So um, there's certainly, you know, certainly horses that have quite severe disease that never look back and run the house down and everyone's heard that story. There's horses that have the slightest disease and show dramatic signs. And then there's a big population of horses that sit in the middle that um, we probably have subclinical disease and we don't recognize it. Glandular disease, um, we have two studies that support this. So uh, in this Canadian study, again, what we saw was horses that were competing internationally we're actually nine times less likely to have glandular disease than horses competing nationally. So that might be that those international horses were better behaviorally adapted to their lifestyle, they were professionals at traveling, whereas the national horses were a little bit more sort of weekend warriors. Um, or it might be the horses that had the ability got to national level and the glandular disease was stopping some of those horses from going on to international level. Um, so it could be a multitude of things, but it's certainly an, an inference there that the glandular disease may impair performance in that population and elite performance in that population. In our study, um, where we looked at racehorses, we asked a simple question before we looked at their stomachs was, do you think the horse is performing at expectation, below expectation or above expectation? And horses that the owner said, this horse is not running as well as it should, were nearly four times more likely to have glandular disease than horses that the owner said, or the trainer said, I'm happy with this performance or it's performing really well. So again, there's an inference, or I think this is a relatively direct inference that these horses are be performing below expectation for some of these reasons that we've talked about. So clinical signs, a wide range of, uh, of in cases of egos, inappetence and poor body condition at population level, effects on behavior, including some of our stereotypies are, are not uncommon and performance, poor performance can be caused by both squamous or glandular disease but we also need to recognize that poor performance can be a whole range of other things as well. And seeking appropriate veterinary guidance and veterinary care in the management of these cases is really, really important because they can be quite difficult to work through. And what we also know is that horses with poor performance very commonly have more than one problem. Um, they can tolerate one issue, but then you start building a multitude of issues and then they start performing below expectation. So that veterinary involvement is very, very important. Uh, can we, how do we diagnose this? There's no evidence to support that blood work is useful, that you can take a hemoglobin or something like that. In fact, all the evidence says that it's not, um, that at a population level, it's not a reliable test. Uh, gastroscopy, looking in the stomach, is by far the preferred method. Um, it tells us both 
the severity of the lesion, although that itself might not be too important, which we'll talk about in a second, but it tells us whether it's squamous or glandular. And when we talk about treatment and prevention next week, that becomes a really, really important piece of information to have. We can make some assumptions based on risk factors, and we'll come back to that later. But even our direct treatment is different for squamous disease than glandular disease. We tend to use omeprazole alone for squamous disease, where we'll use combination therapy um, or other therapies potentially for glandular disease. Again, that's something that's really important that it's done under veterinary management because it starts getting a little bit uh, murky, those waters. What's really important is if we have a horse, particularly with glandular disease, is that we scope it before we stop treatment. We can fairly reliably predict when a squamous horse is gonna heal based on what we know about how the disease heals. It's a relatively simple process, it heals quickly. And we know that within 14 to 28 days, the majority of lesions will heal. Glandular disease is far less predictable. and It's much more important that we confirm it's ended before we go ahead and stop treatment uh, so we don't get a sudden relapse and worsening and go back basically to where we started. Uh, the fecal blood test uh, is popular. It's conceptually very appealing. Take some feces, look for blood in the feces. It'll tell us whether it's ulcers or hindgut ulcers. Uh, unfortunately, the test that's out there is not terribly reliable. Um, this was a study we did a few years ago, didn't get around to publish in, but we took 44 thoroughbred racehorses. We did the blood test on them, and then we did gastroscopy afterwards. And we compared our results between the blood test and the gastroscopy. And basically what we saw was, the test was as accurate as standing in front of the horse as stable and tossing the coin. So literally, there was a 50% chance it would get it right and 50% chance it would get it wrong, depending on whether you had the disease or didn't have the disease. They've continued working on this test, but it really isn't adequately validated to say, I've got a sick horse, will this tell me whether it has ulcers or not? It certainly won't tell you whether it has squamous or glandular disease, but it actually won't even tell you the overarching, does it have disease of some form in its stomach? in an accurate enough measure to use in an individual horse. Uh, can we just put them on treatment? Can we put them on something like a meprazole or a nitidine? Um, yeah, we can. I mean, a meprazole takes, it has a fairly rapid effect and takes three to five days to get its maximal effect. Renitidine is much more uh, immediate. Um, if you have heartburn, you tend to take renitidine because it's a very immediate effect. If you have peptic ulcer disease as a human, you take a meprazole um, because it's more effective over the long run. And we see the same in the horse. Renitidine gives us a very quick effect but omeprazole is much more effective over the long run in terms of actual treating and managing, and reducing the, the disease or treating the disease. Uh, if we get a positive response to our treatment trial, it supports the, um, the presence of gastric ulcers of some form or, or egus of some form. It doesn't differentiate squamous or glandular. And that does potentially have some treatment implications, although we, we can look at the risk factors and the population and use that to guide a little bit our decision making. If it's negative, we need to recognize that it doesn't mean that it's not gastric ulcers, it's not egus, and certainly not glandular disease. Because we see some horses simply just don't respond to omeprazole. There's a small subset of the population that really respond very poorly to oral omeprazole, just don't absorb the drug very well. So it could be one of those. We see other horses that have quite severe lesions and it takes a while for the drug to get on top of the lesion before we start seeing a really clear and demonstrable benefit um, in terms of change of clinical signs. So certainly if we see a negative response to a treatment trial, we need to consider what else could it be, but we can't rule out egus and we certainly can't rule out glandular gastric disease if we have a horse that we otherwise think is at risk of it, and we may go back and scope that horse. Interestingly, there's no evidence to support the worse it looks on endoscope, the more likely it is to have clinical signs. It seems to be quite a dichotomous outcome, uh, which is what it is in human medicine as well. You tend to either have the disease and have likelihood of clinical signs, or you don't have the disease and you don't have a likelihood of clinical signs. So a grade four sounds, grade four out of four sounds much worse than a two out of four or even a one out of four, but it's not necessarily more likely to show clinical signs. And so that treatment response is really important sometimes. We see these horses, they've got relatively mild disease in their stomach, but how they respond to treatment and what the owner reports is a really important part of our decision-making going forward. Uh, there also appears to be this healing threshold where, like I said, for, particularly for glandular disease, you've got to get them down to a certain level of healing uh, or, or up to a certain level of healing before the horse will clinically improve. They often improve a little bit, uh, but they won't go back to the sort of their normal selves until you get complete resolution of the lesion. So uh, we just need to keep that in mind when we're interpreting how a horse responds to a meprazole when we put it on a meprazole or treatment in general. And so, we, you know, this, it's this response to treatment is a really critical element in our decision-making, not just what we see on the endoscope. Um, the endoscope is very important, 
which is why we do it, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle that we need to assign. How important is it to one individual horse or your individual horse? So, you know, these are the sorts of things that we might see. I just put this here towards the end to show you sort of a live gastroscope. We're coming down to the ventral stomach. We've got a very severe lesion there. Um, eventually that one's been there for quite a long period of time, presumably it's caused remodeling and scarring in that stomach as well as having a very thick uh, erosive bed and all that little black spots, basically a scab. Um, so you can imagine that that's, you, you know, that's quite a significant disease potentially in this horse. Um, it's one of the more impressive ones I've seen in a racehorse. That was a thoroughbred racehorse. Um, and so the idea is we'd like to get to them before they get to this stage. We'd like to get to them before they have this really significant remodeling and before they get scarring in their stomach that changes the physical shape and, and possibly the physical structure of the stomach. Um, we'd like to get to them before that uh, and reduce their risk of disease over the long term, not just worry about them when they have something that gets to this stage. For those of you that are a little bit academically inclined, uh, I just put this up as a reference. Um, you can just go into Google and Google Equine College of uh, European College of Equine Internal Medicine consensus statement. And this is a document we put together as a, as a uh, sort of expert panel in 2015. And most of it remains true today. There's a few things that have changed in the last five years, particularly our treatment guidelines have changed a lot in the last five years. But this is a free to download. You can go to the, the JVIM website and download it. And for those of you that are a little bit more academically inclined and, and want to understand a little bit more about the difference between the two diseases, um, then, then I, you know, I'd say it's a good read. I'd probably buy it because I was the, the lead author on that. But um, it's definitely been something that's, you know, formed a cornerstone of our knowledge and thinking for the last five years about equine gastric ulcers. So hopefully there's something new there for everyone. Hopefully there's something different from what you knew before. Um, we're gonna finish up it shortly. We're gonna stop and have our questions. I'll hand back to Nat in a second. Um, next time, we've got another seminar in a couple of weeks. We're gonna really sit down and, and say, well, what do we do with that information? Uh, we're gonna look at the principles of treatment. What are the factors that influence our treatment response? Um, what role does feeding have in our treatment response? And there's some, some work there that's really important that we understand that when we are gonna treat horses, particularly with a meprazole that we understand that how we feed the horse around treatment can have a dramatic impact as to whether we're going to be successful treating the horse or not successful treating the horse. Look at some of those management strategies. How can we take what we know about risk factors and put it into what we do with our horses on a day-to-day -day basis to reduce the risk of disease? And we're going to look at some of the nutritional strategies uh, for disease control. And, and obviously, you know, we're here for Collato. Collato have sponsored this and, and that's my involvement came from Collato. Um, was largely because they actually picked up some research of mine that was looking at this very specific area and we're going to look at that uh, next time as well. Um, so with that I'll hand back to Nat and we'll have a short break. Thanks Ben. Um, so go and have a short break. We'll see you all back here in 10 minutes and answer your questions. Okay, we're back. Um, so I'll just get started with the first question. Ben, have you, oh, sorry. The attendee has seen a number of pylorus glandular gastric disease cases with granuloma type lesions. I have biopsied a couple that have come back as granulomas, often eosinophilic infiltration. Some disappear with treatment, some remain despite improvement in rest of pylorus. What is your experience and thoughts with this? I think someone might be a vet. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> or very, very well educated. Um, I think it raises an important point, which is 
when we talk about squamous disease, squamous disease is really a singular disease. Uh, we talked about primary and secondary disease, but for all clinically intensive purposes, squamous disease is a singular disease and it's very easy to apply a singular treatment and a singular approach to set of recommendations and expect a good outcome. We don't really know about glandular disease, but the general impression that we have is that it's probably a range of different diseases. We know that in humans, in peptic ulcer disease, under the umbrella term of peptic ulcer disease, there's at least 20 individual diseases that all have their own specific nuances about who they are, what they do, why they occur, and how they respond to treatment. I think the same is very much true of the glandular disease. We see different lesion types in different populations, and those different lesion types appear to be easier to treat in some populations than others. And so some of the more spectacular looking lesions are actually the relatively easy ones to treat, and these small nodular um, type lesions can be very, very difficult to treat. Uh, when we biopsy them, we get a range of different things. Uh, we get but almost invariably they're inflammatory lesions. There's some sort of inappropriate inflammation, um, some sort of gastritis associated with that. And so um, we, when we treat them, we, we need to think about that. We also know that if we see lesions, if we biopsy somewhere else in the stomach, we also see inflammation as well. So it's a diffuse gastritis with focal lesions that we're seeing. What we don't know is whether that extends to the rest of the gastrointestinal tract, but certainly we do see horses that appear to have gastric inflammation, and then hindgut signs as well. And so conceptually, the idea of managing these long-term with, with total hindgut, uh, total holistic gut health is very, very logical and very appealing for that glandular population. And then it then goes to also, you know, how do they respond? And the response to treatment is different between those groups. And some of those granuloma ones can be the most difficult and most frustrating to treat. We can manage them symptomatically with, and with acid suppressive drugs, but our ability to make the lesions go away is very frustrating. Um, they say that misery shared is misery halved. And really all I can say for that is in human medicine where they have uh, idiopathic peptic ulcer disease, which is pretty much this non H, -H pylori, non non-steroidal idiopathic simply means we don't know why it occurs. Um, we just put an idiopathic in front of it because it makes us sound much smarter than saying, I don't know, but I don't know peptic ulcer disease in humans they also get a very poor response to treatment and they just manage them long-term symptomatically with drugs uh, that are acid suppressive drugs. So um, we, we don't quite know yet um, what the answer to that. What we do know is, we'll talk about this more next, next seminar, what we do know is if we get really good acid suppression, we can get about 80% of these glandular lesions to heal. And those 20% that don't appear to be very, very refractory to just about anything we try and do with them. Um, and they can be very, very frustrating both for owner and clinician alike and, and obviously expensive and a range of other um, nuance, nuisances associated with them. Okay, I can answer this one. Will there be a recorded version available for attendees? Um, yes, there will be. Uh, we will either send you a link to the recording or it'll be posted on our website. Um, we've had quite a few questions come through, so we'll try to get to uh, most of them. For those of you that have asked uh, management type questions or in regards to meprazole medications, uh, we will answer those questions in series two in a couple weeks time. So the next one is, do you think that horses who eat too fast or don't chew their food carefully could be more likely to suffer with glandular gastric disease. I have an extreme parrot mouth weanling who produces excess saliva, practically hangs from his mouth and was a very sickly foal. He has poor coat condition, a pot belly, etc. I'm wondering if horses who don't add enough saliva by chewing the feed effectively, such as greedy warm bloods or those who have poor oral confirmation may affect the pH gut environment, size of broken down feed, or damage to uh, the passage into the intestine? Um, I guess this is the point where I put the disclaimer in that all advice given is general in nature and not specific. But, you know, I think it hits on a couple of in, a good points. Um, one is some of those, those foals, we do know that these foal, we do know that foals are quite at risk of this glandular gastric disease, particularly 
and we do know that they can get significant scarring and remodeling in their uh, pylorus to the point where it actually affects their their ability of their stomach to empty and that can lead to long-term health consequences so we know that pyloric outflow obstruction can be really important it's not common but obviously if it happens to you it's a very important event it happens to you as a horse it's a very important event uh, in, in your long-term well-being if your stomach is scarred to the point that it's not functioning normally so so that's one consideration the other consideration more directly related to bicarbonate is probably more directly relevant to the squamous gastric disease we know that one of the key factors that uh, is associated with roughage being protective it's a the physical presence of that roughage in that ball but b roughage takes a long time to eat and we know that horses chew a lot more when they eat roughage than when they eat grain we know that they produce a lot more saliva and they ingest a lot more saliva so part of the buffering capacity or part of the protective capacity of eating roughage is the is eating uh chewing and eating and swallowing a lot of bicarbonate and when we talk about management strategies next week we can play on that to safely feed our grain and concentrate feeds around our roughage intake to um, to maximize the benefit, maximize getting all the nutrients that we want to get into a horse while minimizing the risk associated with that secondary volatile fatty acid. So the process of chewing is very important in squamous disease risk and that their production of bicarbonate. The third way to look at it would be to say, why does the horse eat so fast in the first place? Is this an expression of a nervous, dis a, a nervous temperament or behavioral expression of um, an underlying uh, anxiety is a very human word, but but basically an, under, you know, an underlying uh, behavioral mannerism that A, is expressed by eating one way, but is actually also a, predis uh, a predisposing risk factor for something like glandular disease. So to so definitely could see a number of ways that a horse that has that type of presentation potentially could have gastric disease um, related to either causative or uh, as a response to, to having that eating pattern. All right, um, another question that I can answer. Uh, I haven't seen a notification for the next webinar in the series. How do we sign up for it? We will be sending out an EDM and posting the link for the next series on our website, or, sorry, our website and Facebook page. Um, and it will be held on Wednesday, the 20th of May at 6.30 p.m. Um, another question for Ben, how common do you think glandular gastric disease is in clinical practice. My mare had a pyloric ulcer and several vets had no idea what to do. Took more than 18 months to resolve by using a combination of treatments in the end. Omeprazole reduced symptoms, but it regressed over time. Yeah, so the, the latter half of that question, I guess we've touched on already is, is that you know we get a good response to probably about 80 percent of our cases and then there's this 20 percent subset that are very very frustrating to treat for and they're frustrating for everyone to treat um they're frustrating i find as a as a clinician at a clinical level i'm frustrating as a horse owner because i have a horse that gets them um frustrating at a clinical level to treat them to feel like we're trying to do everything right and we're not making progress and then frustrating as a researcher to try and feel like we can't give all the answers yet we want to have all the answers to these to this problem so um, the, the first half of the question is how common do I think glandular gastric disease is? And the answer is very, very common. Um, working in a warm blood sport horse population in Europe, it was by far the most common thing we saw through the medicine service of our practice was gastroscopy and was glandular gastric disease. We almost never saw squamous disease in that population. Um, and it's the same in Australia. We almost never see squamous disease in that population because the dietary management is really, really good. And particularly the roughage management is really good in those horses. But we certainly see a lot of it in, in, um, in those populations. So I think it's probably underestimated. And that's one of the reasons why I personally really like giving these talks and doing this broader education is not to rehash what we already know about squamous disease, but to really try and increase the awareness of glandular disease so that people are looking for early recognition, early intervention, um, and for long-term management strategies to try and reduce the risk overall. Because that really comes back to why, be, why you want to be a vet in the first place, right? Which is to treat sick animals or make sick animals better or not get sick in the first place. Yeah, 
Okay. Do you see different clinical signs in racehorses versus riding horses? Yeah, I think you do. I think that, um, you know, racehorses, it, it's a, a very broad uh, brush to say, I guess, as a racehorse, you've got, you know, trainers who have one horse and trainers who have 200 horses. Um, and they all get a, you know, they all get a really high level of care. I mean, I think the racing industry has got such a focus on it that it has a really high uh, moral obligation and that they largely fulfill to ensure that their horses are well looked after. I think that's the first thing. But I do think there's a difference between the interactions that a racehorse has with its handlers and the interactions that a riding horse has with its handlers. And I think it's those, those personal interactions that show through, particularly for glandular gastric disease, that we see much more commonly reported uh, as a clinician, you know, in a patient that someone brings to you, it's going to often be a subtle change in behaviour or the horse's temperament, or even again, the horse's mood's a bit of a, a, an anthropomorphic term, but um, it's these very subtle changes that the, the riding owners who spend a lot of time connected in, to, with one individual horse or one or two individual horses or a small number um, report. So I, I think we do see different manifestations because of that interaction as much as it is the difference in the disease itself. Uh, it's the interaction we have with those horses that's different. And is girthy behaviour a considered a clinical sign of aegis? Yeah, I mean, we talked about the clinical signs and, you know, there's been studies that have tried to look at that at a population level and show a no effect. You know, at a population level, we can't separate the horses with glandular disease to be more girthy than the horses without glandular disease. But at an individual level, yeah, we definitely see that. We definitely see horses that... Uh, have reports that one of the clinical signs is bad temperament or girthiness, uh, temperament when saddling, uh, reluctance to go forward, I find is a very common one that's reported from particularly the dressage riders. Their horses are sort of reluctant to move, move forward. Um, and then when you treat those horses, they change. And that could be a placebo effect because we all want them to get better. Uh, but it goes back to the game I used to play with the owners. You know, is it better yet? And, and their version of is it better yet incorporated all of those factors um, and their ability to predict healing was remarkably good. Um, so I, I do believe that there is a relationship or there is a, an association at, at an individual level, particularly if you have a horse that's not girthy and has a nice temperament and suddenly changes. You know, if that horse changes its temperament, then you, you know, really got to look for a reason why, because it's, it doesn't make sense that they just suddenly change overnight. You know, leopards don't change their spots. Okay, and as a final question, um, you mentioned how the grade of ulceration didn't necessarily mean that the horse was going to show more clinical signs. Is it possible for a horse to have gastric ulcers and show no signs at all? Yeah, I mean, we definitely see horses where we go down and we you know, where we do these surveys and we go down the racetrack, for example, and scope a, a number of horses, you know, 50 or 80 horses, something like that. And we ask the trainer, you know, which one do you think has them um, and which one doesn't? And there's not a great association between those two. So there's, there's unquestionably plenty of horses out there that have gastric lesions, whether it be squamous or glandular, that go about their lives and have no uh, overt clinical signs. Whether we see subclinical disease in those is, I guess, is the other question, whether there's subclinical performance issues. Generally, the way I sort of look at it in, in the, using the racing analogy is if the horse is racing, beaching everyone, coming home, licking the feed bowl clean and just shiny and healthy and looks fantastic, we probably aren't overly concerned what's in its stomach. We're probably not overly concerned whether it has endoscopic lesions or not. But the moment the horse stops doing all those things for us, the moment the horse is not pinpoint perfect doing exactly what it wanted to do, racing, pinpoint perfect what we wanted to do, eating and these sorts of things, then I think we need to ask the question and gastric, gastric ulcers or gastric lesions is very high up on our list. The riding horse analogy of that would be the horse that's perfectly okay at home and when it goes away and travels and then stops eating or has a reduced appetite when they eat and a very, very high percentage of those horses, if we put them on trial therapy with acid suppressors during that away period, will not exhibit that behavior while they're away. And that really strongly supports the idea of gastric pathology because the acid suppressive drugs do nothing for the hindgut. They only uh, reduce the expression of disease of the stomach. And so, you know, I think it's very 
environmentally dependent or situationally dependent as well as being individual horse dependent. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ben. I think we'll wrap it up there. Your talk was really, really informative and insightful. I know we all will have learned lots during it. And thank you again to everyone for attending. We had a really great turnout this evening and we look forward to seeing you all in two weeks time uh, where we will discuss treatment, management and prevention of EGIS. So thanks again, and we will see you all soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.